Welcome to Experimental, the science show where men play with robots, oh. robots play with cows, and insects fly aeroplanes. We separate this man's head from his shoulders. <laughs> and find out how a high-tech pair of trainers could force this kid off computer games. But first, World Championship Football. Freiburg Football Stadium in Germany. For one night only, robots are attempting to take over the world's favourite game. And we're hunting the man responsible for this atrocity. Professor Bernhard Nabel is an expert in artificial intelligence and his robot is the first ever developed to take on a human at football and win. My specialty is AI in robotics and I'm trying to build robots that can play soccer and then are able to beat the human world champions. A robot that can beat Brazil? What on earth does Bernhard's creation look like? Well, something like this, actually. And the contest isn't taking place in a stadium. It's in a pub around the corner. <laughs> Bernhard's robot plays table football and is rather good at it. So good that later tonight it's going to be taking on world champion Thierry Muller. Bernhard is Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics at the University of Freiburg. He made his name building robots that play football against robots. And they've won the Robo World Cup three times. But Bernhard's dream is that one day his World Cup winning robot team could take on a human team and kill them. But with strikers like this, he's got a long way to go which is why he's gone back to basics. Well, you switch to a game that is a bit simpler, and a bit simpler is this game here, which is uh, table soccer, where you uh, have a lot of control, but still there's all this uncertainty you have, and, well, now we built such a system. Bernhard's creation is a robotic wonder. It features eight powerful motors that slide and twist the four playing rods. An infrared camera updates the position of the ball 50 times a second. And against a random sample of people, it wins 75% of the time. Which makes Bernhard's machine the first in history that can beat humans at a physical game. That was a third goal against me. Annoying. It's so popular that a commercial version has now been made. The camera is now underneath. And it even pays for itself. It's great at beating PhD students. But we wanted to know how it would cope against a real challenge. So we set up a showdown against eight-time German and one-time world champion Thierry Muller. No wonder Bernhard's looking nervous. So a bright start by these two players in this first of six goals match. The robot, of course, playing in its usual home colours of blue. Both teams trying not to take any chances here. Oh, great goal from midfield. 1-0 to the robot. But they're off again. Nice control from Thierry there. Oh, great reply. Lovely tour. Caught the defence napping there. Oh, terrible slip up by the goalie there. He won't want to see that one again. 
Three, one. And the robot really is in charge. Can Thierry make it back from here? Three, two. And another. Thierry's really turning on the style. Five, three. Just one more needed for victory. And it's there. The human race wins again. And luckily, like any good manager, Bernhard has the excuses ready. It was not in the best form. It has problems. And 6-3 is actually, I think, a very good result. But what about our world champion? Conceding three goals against a robot, you must be sick as a parrot, Thierry. A little bit, a little bit, but, but I win. But maybe not for long. We are working on um, making the machine much better and, well, one way to do that is uh, to use imitation learning techniques so that we uh, watch what the human does and then learn from it and uh, improve uh, the, the style of playing. So, Thierry, however good you think you are, soon the computer will be watching and learning from your every move. But, for the time being at least, humans rule. In a moment, Experimental meets the insects, destined to take over in the cockpit. But first, let's go to the test department for a spot of hanging and drowning. The human head. Essential feature or just somewhere to keep your hat? It's clear that our heads are crammed full of useful stuff. But just how much does a human head actually weigh and how on earth do you work it out? On the face of it, it's a simple task. But when you try it for real, you soon come up against some serious problems. There are, of course, some rather drastic solutions to the problem, but decapitating scientists for entertainment is a bit of a no-no these days, at least on this channel. But fear not, there is a slightly safer way to isolate the head from the body. The test department's Head Separator 3000 system. By dangling our demonstrator upside down, the head hangs freely. Job done. But what about the weight? Well, that's what the bucket's for. That's right, we're going to dunk him. The water that spills over the edge will be directly proportional to the volume of his head. And because a good bit of us is water, that water will weigh pretty much the same as our demonstrator's head. So here are the results. Our demonstrator's head displays 6.5 litres of water, giving a weight of approximately 6.5 kilos. Remember, if you've got a tricky problem to solve, don't lose your head. In a moment, we'll be finding out if one of these can be flown by one of these. And the test department will unveil their new propulsion system for submarines. But first, let's head down to the farm and fondle some udders. It's four o'clock in the morning, and with military precision, dairy workers in hundreds of farms across Britain are preparing cows for the first milking of the day. But not on this farm. This is Manor Farm in Oxfordshire. Some of the cows are having a lie-in. Others are enjoying their breakfast. And there's not a human in sight. On this farm, it's the cows, not humans, that dictate the milking timetable. And it's all thanks to a robot that allows the cows to be milked whenever they feel like it. Welcome to the first organic dairy farm to be fully robotic. Farmer Neil Rowe is the man in charge. He believes that the key to keeping cows healthy is to make them happy. The entire farm is a shrine to bovine joy, and at the heart of it is a piece of seriously high-tech wizardry. Basically, we have a robot which um, interacts with the cows and the cows with it, and we've created what is a voluntary milking system. 
Dairy cows can produce on average 30 litres of milk a day, but can only carry 10 litres in their udders, so milking is crucial to keeping them comfortable. When they feel full, they wander over to the milking shed and queue up for the robot. It's designed to be a pleasurable experience to keep the cows coming back. The robot recognises a tag around the cow's neck as it enters and calculates how much milk it will have produced since its last visit. It then mixes up a meal to replace the exact protein and carbohydrate that the cow is about to lose. Rotating brushes sterilise and massage the cow's teats to stimulate the milk flow and vacuum pumps latch on, guided by a series of invisible lasers. The milk from each quarter of the udder is collected separately and its exact protein and fat content analysed and logged into a central computer. The cows are very, very relaxed and um, they're much, much quieter than they would be in a conventional farm where people are, are telling them what to do. And it's all to the soothing tones of classical music. Yeah, normally the cows like to listen to Mozart and um, they do seem to like listening to it and there is some scientific evidence to say that uh, when they're listening to Mozart the cows transfer the milk from their udder into this jar up to 10% faster. The robotic system isn't a new idea. It's been around for years but was originally developed for highly intensive factory farming where the cows spend their short lives in concrete sheds and are pumped full of drugs to hold off disease. Where Neil is unique is in his approach to the technology. He recognised how the robot's features could be integrated into an organic ethos, where the cows are free to enjoy the finer things in life and rampant disease is a thing of the past. His cows are happy cows. But don't just take our word for it. Dr. Dirk Zaire is one of the world's top bovine experts. And he's a big fan of Neil's setup. Blimey, I'm glad he's not my doctor. The uterus is a three. Muck consistency is about a three. And the digestibility is a one. So that is very good. Uh, the nice thing about Neil's farm is he does not use drugs. We do alter it here with management because management is the key how to improve this. And Neil's farm is the, the, the proof of the pudding, so to speak. His disease incidence is, is very low. His culling rate is very low, which is a sign on itself of happy, healthy cows. You see here, eating my hand, eating from my hand. Well, you know, this is a happy animal. Now that Neil's gone robotic, he only has to visit the farm a couple of times each day for routine maintenance. And this frees him up to spend more time with his family. There are one or two farmers' wives I know that are not too keen on it because it means their husbands are around a lot more. So Neil gets to do the school run now. And he's also spent time pioneering a system that selects milk with particular qualities. We can actually ask the robot to select milk from Pacific cows which are producing the highest quality milk for making ice cream. Um, there's no other way of doing that in a conventional system. This ice cream manufacturer in Oxford is able to specify the exact protein and fat levels it needs for the perfect scoop. And they're so proud of it, they have Neil's cows on the wall. This is a win-win situation, that the cows can win by having a better lifestyle, the farmer wins because he has more time and a better return on his investment. The consumer wins because they're getting a better product. And the final word goes to Daisy, which I think means I couldn't agree more. <laughs> on Experimental, we like to ask the difficult questions, such as, why is it you can't get a good cup of tea on an aeroplane? Well, let's see what happens when our intrepid aviator Etienne and his trusty kettle take to the skies. 
At takeoff, the kettle is happy to boil away at exactly 100 degrees centigrade. As he rises through the clouds, something very odd begins to happen. As the air pressure drops with altitude, so does the temperature at which the water boils. By the time Etienne gets to 10,000 feet, the water is boiling at a mere 90 degrees Celsius. And as he climbs through 30,000 feet, it's dropped even further to around 70 degrees Celsius. But what's Etienne got to do with tea on a jetliner? Well, the pressure inside a jet plane is kept at around 8,000 feet, which means that the boiling temperature of water is down to around 90 centigrade. And as every Englishman will tell you, that's simply not hot enough to get the full flavour out of the tea leaves. Coming up, fireworks for your goldfish, courtesy of the test department. But first, an item to freak out anyone with a fear of flying. Ever wonder how the brain of a top gun works? How it can make thousands of life or death decisions in a few fractions of a second? Well, that was one of the questions running through the mind of Dr Jack Gray of the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. But he wasn't interested in sticking wires into the brains of the flyboys. He wanted to study a pilot that could knock any top gun for six. Meet the Locust, the ultimate formation flyer. I'm pretty fond of them. They're, they're very well adapted creatures. They are much more complex than we have thought. And as we learn more, we discover how much more complex they actually are. What Dr. Gray wanted to do was to find out how the locust primitive nervous system allowed it to fly and navigate in massive swarms without constantly colliding into its mates. So how do you study an insect flying? Meet Loco Simulator 1. First, the locust is fixed to a small length of fishing line and then suspended in a specially designed wind tunnel. As soon as the fan begins to turn, the locust feels the wind over its head and does what locusts do best, fly. The locust moves freely, allowing Dr Gray to film and study its natural behaviour. And to make the locust do more than simply fly forward, Dr Gray projected images of possible objects onto a screen inside the wind tunnel. What he found confirmed his suspicions, that the locust's brain was extremely responsive. It has very fast neurons that can detect approaching objects and allowing the locust to make that very fast decision as to where to go. So what are these neurons he talks about? Watch what happens when a stimulus enters our flyboy's head. Oh, I say, look at those eyes. What is it? The stimulus fires up millions of neurons. So. And whilst he thinks a lot, making a decision seems to take a long time. Ready to go. Now, let's see things from the locust point of view. Not many neurons involved, and a fast, simple decision. Dr Gray's wind tunnel had proved to him that locust brains can react extremely fast to stimulus. But it wasn't enough. He wanted to dig deeper and actually see what their brains were doing. And for that, he needed a new simulator. Now the locust is mounted on a small pillar, with sensors monitoring its nervous system. Instead of the crude images of LocoSim 1, the locust is now immersed in a virtual reality world and is free to fly wherever it wants to. When the locust is in the flight simulator, I mean, we've actually turned it into a joystick. And so when the locust tries to move, that signal moves the environment in a way the locust might expect it to. Although it's a long way off, there are some who think we may be able to use the signals coming from the locust nervous system to control not just the simulator, like Dr Gray has, but tiny aircraft that can fly by themselves. 
However, it's going to take a long time for a human Top Gun to turf the Top Guns out of the cockpit. Still to grace your screens, high-tech trainers designed to get this little lad off the couch. But first, someone told the test department that fireworks burn underwater. Rather than just fluttering her eyelashes and trying to look interested, this test department tester decided she'd find out. Naturally, with fireworks being very dangerous, a firework testing 3000 machine needed to be constructed. OK, so it's a fish tank and a plank of wood, but it'll do the trick. And now for the big moment. Will the firework burn underwater? Light the blue touch paper, stand well back and dip. Works. Our little friend wasn't telling porky pies after all. But why is it working? Well, water does have oxygen in it. That's why we call it H2O. But that's not what's happening here. When a firework burns, it uses oxygen that's locked up in the chemicals within the firework itself. So not only can it burn underwater, but it would also do the same quite happily on the moon. Maybe so, but remember, this experiment is very dangerous and environmentally extremely irresponsible. Just look at that mess! People have been banging on about obesity for so long that some adults seem to have actually heard the message and are trying their best to tramp off the pounds. Sadly, for every extra step taken by the big people in the gym, there's another section of the population taking another bite. That's right, kids. And that's got experts like Jane Wardle very worried. Childhood obesity is a tremendous problem in all Western countries at the moment. Overweight in childhood puts you on a track for becoming an overweight adult with all the health costs that that's associated with. And you may also see health costs in childhood of being overweight, for example, um, raised blood pressure, raised lipids, even, you know, in extreme cases, you'll see insulin resistance and the development of diabetes in childhood. But try telling that to a kid just six kills short of level nine. The house could fall down and they'd never notice. However, Gillian Swan of Brunel University thinks she's got an invention that could do the trick. Well, I wanted to tackle obesity by finding an alternative to diet. So I looked at what children like doing, which I found to be watching television, and tried to tie this in so that television was the reward. Gillian is an expert in embedded technology, the art of sticking technology into everyday objects. And the object she stuck her technology into, shoes. The idea is that a sensor in the shoe detects the amount of steps you've taken each day. And when you get home, the shoe tells your TV or game station how far you've walked. Clock up a decent distance and the TV will switch on for a set amount of time. <laughs> when the time runs out, the screen goes black. And the only way you can switch things on again is to get off the sofa and start exercising. To get a full hour's worth of electronic frills, a kid would have to clock up 6,000 paces, or almost five kilometers. But with kids watching around 2.5 hours of TV a day, they'll need to schlep nearly 12 kilometers to gain their full reward. Well, I think it's a really neat idea. In our experience of working with very overweight and obese children in treatment, um, is that children can quite enjoy any little gizmo which will measure their steps and can get quite into trying to increase their number of steps. So if the shoes could do the trick, then that would be good news. So if the square-eyed shoes catch on, we might just see kids using their trainers for, uh, well, training. 